A while ago, one day, uh, when I was here, Wang Gong referred to me as a Dharma vending machine. I was kind of surprised. Um, wasn't sure what to make of this. I, I knew that I often had a big mouth, um, but um, it was, I had mixed feelings about that title. Uh, uh, but I think she was trying to encourage people to talk to me, um, uh, you know, because I'm pretty good at answering questions. And so it was with a little chagrin that um, she asked me for this meeting to um, present on a particular passage in, in the practice uh, section of our scriptures. Um, and I think this particular section uh, is about, um, so practice is the threefold practice, and so I think this section is focusing more on um, inquiry into human affairs and universal principles. So let me read you parts of it. Number 22, the founding master said, most people only recognize those who have read widely in scriptures to be persons who embody the way. Often people will listen with trusting ears to one who quotes from ancient scriptures, but will pay little attention to the one who elucidates those fundamental truths directly in simple language, even though both may expound the same truth. How frustrating. Scriptures contain the truths elucidated by the past sages and philosophers of this world in order to enlighten people's manners and minds. Through the ages, expiations and annotations have been added to them, forming the Confucian five carts of books and the Buddhist 80,000 pages of sutras. It would be difficult to read through all of them even if you devoted your entire life to it. What free time would you have to acquire real competence in cultivation, inquiry, and choice? What then would be the point of studying all five carts of books and reading the entire 80,000 pages of sutras? I urge you not to let yourself be distracted by so many complicated old scriptures, but instead diligently practice by making use of simple doctrines and convenient methods, and after you have gained extraordinary capability, just glance over other ancient scriptures and all kinds of doctrines for reference. If you do so, one morning's quick consultation will be better than 10 years of reading. Well, huh. <laughs> Dharma vending machine. Uh, what's she saying to me? Um, I'm not sure, uh, but I, 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 I kind of suspect that she isn't really saying anything to me, um, but you never know. Uh, so I thought about this, and, and so I'll give you a little background on, on, on Buddhism and its be a Dharma vending machine. Um, so in, in, uh, when the first Buddha was teaching, there wasn't any real writing, and so all of his teachings had to be memorized. And for, and, and for 200 years, the teachings were passed along monk to monk, and they specialized in different sections, but they kept it going and memorized it. And then about 300 BC, Buddha was about 600 BC, about 300 BC, writing came along and they, they started writing them down. But the tradition of memorizing the scriptures continued, and what had originally been this forest wandering monk tradition became a very institutionalized uh, grand endeavor in India. So about zero around there, um, Mayana Buddhism came about. I learned this from a, a lecture that I went to by a, a scholar. Um, his idea was that Mayana Buddhism came about because they were disgruntled by this institutionalization and moving away from the original purpose of these scriptures. And so they wanted to go back to basics, back to nature. And so for a while, that was the Mayana Buddhist approach. But of course, it moved back to being these big institutions, scholar, so forth, branching out in different directions. But, you know, this knowing the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, uh, still was really important, and you were a person of the way if you knew the scriptures. 
At different points in time, there are people that interrupted this. One of the famous ones was Bodhidharma, when he came from the West to China, where he insisted that he didn't know anything, there wasn't anything to say, everything was empty, there was no reason to talk about stuff, just meditate, just sit, the beginning of Zen Buddhism. Um, and then coming to the present, uh, or near present, uh, Master Sote-san, who had very little education at the time when he was awakened, uh, perhaps elementary school education, achieved full awakening on his own with no teachers, and then he started learning scriptures and so forth. Um, and so one of the things that he was devoted to was creating a Buddhism for the world, not for, not for monasteries, not for a select few, but for everyone. And so when he created these scriptures, he created them with that in mind. He wanted everybody to be able to understand them, everybody able to be able to master them and, and, and take inspiration from these, in a sense, distilled uh, teachings from the 80,000 and the five books, you know, because he brought together Buddhism and Confucianism. So what does that mean to us? What does that mean to me? <laughs> um, you know, I think that the balance in the threefold practice is very important to us, that you know, we not focus only on mind practice, um, not focus only on the teachings and memorizing and things like that, and not only focus on the precepts like being, you know, a perfect person who never does anything that violates any principle, and that's their whole practice, you know, being perfect, being, you know, that rather we want this balance. We want to live in the world as real practitioners, and we can gain a tremendous amount just from studying this Red Book. You know, and I encourage you to do that. And, and we have study groups and so forth for, for continuing the study of it. And um, even though I haven't been able to take a part in it, I think it's a wonderful, great opportunity to make use of these scriptures and really get inspired by them. So what about me? What about me? Well, I'm not sure that um, I'm not trying to be impressive. Um, and learn everything so I can show off. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that's the main reason. Um, I think there's two big reasons why uh, I've been, I, number one, I don't memorize anything um, uh, except for our, um, the things we chant up here. I've over time memorized that. Um, but I don't do it to memorize. Um, I do it the reason I do it is for me, going through different teachings of all, all the ones I can find, including outside of Buddhism, but mainly in Buddhism, is for inspiration, um, not for, uh, you know, to learn something that I'm then going to, you know, tell somebody else. Um, but the other reason that I became, why that name Dharva vending machine, whatever that means, might be apply to me is, all the things I've read are kind of sitting in the back of my mind. I can't just call them up anytime. I can't just say, give a lecture on this and that, um, usually. But when people ask me questions, that's when this reading that I've done, or listening to podcasts and so forth, that's when it comes forth. That's when it comes up and I can say, oh, I know what you're talking about. I can show, let's think about this and think about this and even bring stuff from what I've read, but hopefully not with the idea of impressing you because I can talk about what somebody said, because the reason I'll say somebody said this is so you don't think I said that, <laughs> you know, that I made it, that I thought of it by myself or I thought of it at all, you know. So is it really something to aspire to, to be a Dharma vending machine? I'm not so sure. Um, so Tesan certainly has something to say about it, and I think he's absolutely right. That point here is this balanced, uh, middle way teaching that involves what we do here and what we do in the world. So thank you for listening to me, and uh, you can decide for yourself about being a Dharma vending machine. <laughs> thank you.